Hello, I am pleased to present you our study on factors associated with the emergence of resistance mutations in patients failing dual or triple integrase inhibitor based regimen in a French national survey. This study was conducted on behalf of the ANRS Virology Network. Here are my disclosures. For approximately 20 years, three drug regimen have been the concept of antiretroviral therapy. However, considering the lifelong art and the need to decrease the potential adverse effects of drug exposure, some alternative strategies have been proposed, especially two drug regimen. It has been shown a similar proportion of virological HIV suppression between two drug and three drug regimen for patients with an integrase inhibitor based regimen in some clinical randomized trials. It has been shown for already suppressed patients with dolutegravir and lamivudine, dolutegravir and rilpivirine, cabotegravir and rilpivirine. It has been shown also in naive patients with dolutegravir and lamivudine. In these trials, there were very few virological failures and very few uh, resistance mutations in case of virological failure. However, there is a need to get more data about resistance to integrase inhibitor in the context of two drug versus three drug uh, regimen in clinical practice. So the aim of our study was to compare in a multicenter observational retrospective study on failing HIV patients receiving a two drug or three drug regimen including an integrase inhibitor the presence of at least one integrase resistance mutations and baseline variable associated to the occurrence of at least one integrase mutations, in particular to distinguish between the effect of the following factors, receiving a two-drug or three-drug regimen, the genotypic sensitivity score associated to the other drugs and the integrase inhibitor in the regimen, and the integrase inhibitor received. The inclusion criteria were uh, HIV-infected patients followed in a clinical site within the INRS network between 2014 and 2019 in France, failing an integrase-containing regimen with raltegravir, elvitegravir, and dolutegravir, and the virological failure was defined as two consecutive HIV overload above 50 copies per ml. First, uh, a, an univariate analysis uh, was performed uh, to study the associated factor, and uh, in the multivariate analysis, only variables with a p-value below 0.1 were retained for building the final multivariate model using a stepwise uh, selection. Integral sequences were determined on plasma failure in each participating laboratory. And this is the list of the integral associated resistance mutations used in the study. Resistance was interpreted uh, using the last INRS algorithm and the genotypic sensitivity score of the current regimen without the integral inhibitor was calculated as follows one for uh, susceptible, 0 0.5 for intermediate, and zero for resistance. We analyzed uh, 1,104 patients, 207 in the dual therapy group, and 897 patients in the triple therapy group. There were some differences between the two groups, uh, indeed, uh, patients treated uh, by a two-drug regimen were older, HIV infected for a longer time, receiving an integrase inhibitor for a longer time. They had a higher CD4 cell count and a lower viral load at failure. In addition, in the two-drug regimen, there were less uh, naive patients and more patients receiving an integrase inhibitor for the first time. In the two-drug regimen group, patients were receiving raltegravir in 70% of cases, 
and dolutegravir in 30% of cases. No patients were treated by elvitegravir. And in the triple therapy group, patients were receiving raltegravir, uh, elvitegravir, and dolutegravir in 30% of cases approximately. In the two drug regimen group, the associated treatment to integrase inhibitor was 1 PI in 53% of cases and 1 NNRTI in 35% of cases. In the three drug regimen group, the associated treatment to integrase inhibitor was mainly two NRTIs. Among the failing patients, 42 patients of them had viruses harboring at least one integrase resistant mutation. 26 had one mutation, 10% had two mutations, 4% had three mutations, and 2% had four and more mutations. Overall, the N155 and the L74 mutations are the more com most commonly observed mutations with 15% and 14% of cases, respectively. As you can see, overall, patients failing raltegravir and elvitegravir had viruses with a higher level of integrase inhibitor predicted genotypic resistance at failure than patients failing dolutegravir. Here are the results of the um, statistical analysis showing uh, the factors associated with the occurrence of at least one integrase resistance associated mutation. Although two drug regimen was associated with a higher risk of emergence of integrase resistance associated mutations in univariate analysis, the factors that remained associated in the multivariate analysis were a higher level of viral load at failure and the non-B subtypes with a higher risk of occurrence of at least one integrase mutation. A higher level of GSS and patients receiving dolutegravir containing regimen with a lower risk of occurrence of at least one integrase resistant mutation. So in conclusion, this is a large cohort of patients failing an integrase-based regimen followed in hospital co clinical care. Among patients failing an integrase-based regimen, 42% harbored viruses with at least one integrase-resistant mutation that is similar uh, to some uh, previously published uh, studies. The most frequent resistance mutations observed were uh, the 155 and the 74 mutations. And overall, the level of integrase genotypic resistance was lower for patients failing dolutegravir than patients failing raltegravir or elvitegravir. Finally, considering the occurrence of at least one integrase resistance mutation at failure, the multivariate analysis showed a higher risk with a higher level of viral load at failure, a non-B subtype, and a lower risk with a higher level of GSS and for patients receiving dolutegravir. There, were, there was no difference between two drug regimen and three drug regimen. I would like to thank all the INRS resistant group and especially the coordination committee. And I would like also to thank Dr. Catasulier for preparing these slides. Thank you also to, the, to all the INRS resistant group. Thank you for your attention. Good afternoon. I thank the organizers of the meeting for these invitations and I'm delighted to present you our results. No conflict of interest for with the subject. The peripheral blood monoclear cells, PBMC, include archived 
drug resistance mutation that reflect pre previous treatment regimen failure. Highly diversified drug resistance mutation in proviral DNA lead to their and a consistent detection by Sanger technology. Ultradeep sequencing is more prone technology to detect minor variants. Also, ultradeep sequencing of proviral DNA may be an interesting alternative to detect HIV drug resistance mutation in situations where RNA genotyping by Sanger sequencing is not informative. However, its implementation in clinical practice has not yet been validated. Our objective is to evaluate the pertinence of ultra-deep sequencing to explore archived drug resistance mutation in comparison to cumulative HIV RNA genotyping performed by Sanger approach. To address answer about hypothetic integration of DNA ultra-deep sequencing as a decisional marker in clinical practice. 169 HIV infected patients experiencing several lines of antiretroviral therapy, and among them, 16 naive patients recently diagnosed were included. For ultra-deep of HIV DNA, samples used in this study were emanated from routine HIV DNA genotyping-resistant testing. Ultradeep sequencing was performed on HIV protease and reverse chronotriptase fragments from PCR products amplified according to the NRS recommended procedures. For each DNA sample, PCR was performed in triplicate in the first PCR step. Pirate end and indexed libraries for MySec using the next era DNA sample preparation kit from Illumina. The generated reads were then processed in the bioinformatics pipeline Vigo developed in-house by a bioinformatics team from the genetic department. Sequencing products are then analyzed using a bioinformatics pipe called Vigo, which allows for each mutation to calculate the background noise to generate consensus sequence, to perform a clustering to find similarity and identify clusters. Reads with high quality are considered and aligned against the reference sequence. Reads with a stop codon were excluded. Finally, archived DNA drug resistance mutation with ampersand frequency were then considered. For the period from April 2015 to June 2018, 169 genotypes tests were performed. In 21 cases, two tests were performed in the same period and were not included in the study. Of the remaining, 37 had missing data. In the end, the study concerns 111. The main characteristics of the study population are there are 29% of women, 60% of patients are in CDC clinical stage B or C, about 40% of patients are on a therapeutic regimen including an integrase inhibitor. The main virological characteristics of the study population are about 82% of, of patients have at least one RNA genotype. 72% of patients had the DNA genotype by Sanger methods. In over 70% of cases, subtype B were found. At the time of sampling, 58% of patients were in virological success. For greater clarity, we have assigned arbitrarily a score to the resistance mutation. Zero score for mutations associated with APOBEC. Score one for secondary mutation, which by themselves do not induce resistance. Score two for mutations that induce resistance to a single antiretroviral molecule. Score three for mutations that induce resistance to two or more antiretroviral molecules. 
The global illustration of comparison between two assays show that what is in red corresponds to the common mutations detected by the compared two tests. What is in gray corresponds to mutations detected by only one of the two tests. Figures A, B, C are about all mutations irrespective of their score. Figures D, E, and F focuses on drug resistance mutation with two and three assignate score. Globally, ultra-deep DNA sequencing and cumulative RNA genotype were more prone to detect drug resistance mutation than Sanger DNA. Drug resistance mutation detected only by Illumina in DNA are at very low frequencies when compared to either cumulative RNA or Sanger DNA. These observations raise questions about the relevance of these resistance mutation at low level detected only by ultra-deep sequencing in proveral DNA, and the encourage to characterize the cofactors that can modulate the frequency of drug resistance mutation archiving in the DNA compartment. We found that drug resistance mutations, all mutations, are detected at the high level in ultra-deep DNA sequencing when it's detected more recently in RNA, either for all mutations, irrespective of a senior score, or for drug resistance mutations with two and three score. This is also true, irrespective of antiretroviral classes either an RTI or an NRTI. These observations suggest that there is a possible clearance of drug resistance mutations in the DNA compartment. And in the next step, we wanted to characterize factors that could modulate this clearance. Our working hypothesis is that the duration of undetectability favors the clearance of drug resistance mutations within the DNA compartment. Between two cases with different undetectability durations, we expected to have a fewer variant archived in case one with a long time of undetectability compared to more resistance variants archived in case two with a short time of undetectability. As illustrated for drug resistance mutations with 2 and 3 score, we found that the longer duration of undetectability was inversely correlated to the magnitude detection of drug resistance mutations in the DNA compartment by ultra-deep sequencing. However, in certain situations, the duration of undetectability does not explain everything, so we tried to characterize other factors that could also modulate the level of archiving. Our working hypothesis is that the duration of replication under selection pressure favors the level of archiving between two cases according to time replication. We would expect to have less resistant variant in case one with a short time replication under selection pressure compared to case two with a long time replication under selection pressure. As we can see, the treatment failure durations modulate positively the level of drug resistance mutations archiving. This is true for an RTI and as easily illustrated with 184V mutations, since it's only selected by 3TC and FTC, we see a good correlation between duration failure mounts and the frequency of drug resistance mutation detected by Illumina in DNA. Not shown, but the same correlation was also observed with an RTI. This case illustrates the importance to test a large amount of DNA. Profile of cumulative RNA genotypes corresponding to seven genotypes performed between 1999 and 2008 at least two PBMMC fractions were tested separately and as a pool.
in duplicate by Illumina. As you can see, drug resistance mutations involved in the major resistance to an NRTI was no, were not detected in both fractions. 1IT1C not detected in fraction 1, and 101 and 190 not detected in fraction 2. Interestingly, no drug resistance mutations were missed when the two fractions were pulled. The last point concerns the possibility of using DNA genotyping by ultra deep sequencing in clinical practice. At baseline, corresponding to time where ultra deep sequencing DNA were performed, we can observe a weak difference in the mean GSS to antiretroviral taken at this time among patients with or without virological success. We also looked at those months follow up the response to antiretroviral therapy according to the GSS for the ultra deep sequencing DNA test and the cumulative RNA. We have observed that in all cases, ultra deep DNA does as well as cumulative RNA to predict virological success when the GSS greater than or equal to 2. Also, both assays could similarly predict with the same proportion virological failure when GSS is less than 2. For the conclusion, our strategy, based on a large amount of DNA included in PCR assays, was highly sensitive and that may allow us to deal with the fluctuation of archived drug resistance mutation in the DNA compartment. As shown, the magnitude of archived drug resistance mutation are affected by undetectability duration and the time duration of biological failure. In real life, in cases where cumulative RNA is not available, DNA genotyping by ultra deep sequencing may be helpful. For more, more data is needed to assess the predictive value of filtrative sequencing DNA in clinical practice. Finally, I would like to thank the patients, institutional support, and all the colleagues with whom I collaborate daily. Thank you for your attention. Good evening to everyone and thank you to the organizers for having selected this abstract about switching to INSTI regimens in patients with undetectable viremia and past virological failure and or resistance. About 12% of people living with HIV have previous virological failure according to Italian data. Data on optimization of antiretroviral therapy with INSTI regimens are limited and uh, current guidelines do not specifically address this issue. They only provide some general rules like uh, avoid to switch to lower genetic barrier regimens, consider always the cumulative genotype, the tolerability and toxicity issues, while the NRTI usage in the context of, of previous resistance is still debated. Um, Raltegravir-based regimens resulted to be less effective than PI in patients with previous virological failure, while for lv based regimens, we have some mixed results in the, in the same contest, and high virological efficacy was demonstrated with Dolutegravir plus 2 NRTI in patients with residual NRTI activity, and also with Bictegravir, um, tenofovir alafenamide and FTC in patients virologically suppressed but with previous NRTI resistances. Few data are available for the other INSTI-based options. This is a retrospective multicenter study conducted in Italy um, that included patients who were um, more than 18 years old, are treated with HIV RNA below 50 copies at baseline, who had at least a previous virological failure followed by at least one genotype and that had switched to an ST-containing regimen. 
primary endpoint of this study was the viral rebound defined as confirmed HIV RNA uh, over 50 copies per milliliter. We analyzed the incidence ratio of viral rebound estimated according to GSS and according to high resistance level to an RTI that was defined as having the um, K65 mutation having at least three uh, TAM or having the um, insertion T69 at the cumulative genotype. We use the inverse probability weighted Cox regression to estimate causal hazard ratio of viral rebound, adjusting for the main confounders that were CD4 cells count at nadir, mode of HIV transmission, duration of viral suppression, and number of previous, of, of, uh, previous genotype. The previous virological failure was defined as two consecutive viral load over 50 copies or one viral load um, over 1,000 copies. And the baseline for uh, the analysis was the date of the switch to the EC regimen under uh, viral suppression. The regimens started at switch were categorized in four groups, two NRTI plus first generation INSTI, two NRTI plus first generation INSTI, or ISTI plus PI boosted, or ISTI plus NRTI or NNRTI. In this slide, there are the main characteristics of our population. We found 654 patients respecting inclusion criteria. Regiments started at baseline were 2NRTI plus INSTI of first generation in 33% uh, of patients, 2NRTI plus dolutegravir in 26% of patients, and INSTI plus API, a booster PI, in 21% of patients, and INSTI plus NNRTI or NRTI in 19% of patients. As mm, we can see, this is a quite heavily treated population characterized by 21 years of HIV infection, 17 years of heart exposure, CD4 cells count at Nadir where was of 116 cells. Patients who switched to dual therapy uh, composed of ISTI plus NRTI or NRTI were characterized by a longer time of HIV suppression, while patients who started a triple regimen based on uh, first-generation ISTI were more frequently co-infected with hepatitis C and more frequently showed intravenous drug use as mode of, a of HIV infection. In this slide, we have the GSS and resistance level to NRTI in the different groups. We don't have time to go on details, but on the left, we have the GSS in the overall population. 33% of patients had a GSS below 2, and 67% of them had a GSS equal or superior to 2. Incident rate of viral rebound was comparable throughout all these stratifications by GSS and by resistance level to NRTI and vary between 8 and 9 uh, per 100 person year follow up. Patients in first generation INSTI containing regimens had an incident, incidence rate of viral rebound of 10.1 per 100 person year follow up and those in uh, uh, second generation in sti containing regimens had an incident rate of 6.5 per 100 person year follow up. In this table, we can see crude and adjusted hazard ratios of the risk of error rebound from fitting a weighted Cox regression model according to GSS. And this model is adjusted for CD4 cells count at nadir, duration of viral suppression, number of previous genotypes, and mode of HIV transmission. By multivariate analysis, patients with GSS equal or more than 2 had a lower risk of viral rebound, 
the adjusted hazard ratio is of 0 0.60, the 95% confidence interval of 0 0.31 to 1.14. Then those um, with GSS below 2, but this result is not statistically significant in the overall population analysis even though we reach the statistical significance for the INST plus an RTI or an RTI group. Similar results at Cox regression analysis were obtained also with the other definition of resistance. In fact, by multivariate analysis, patients with higher resistance had higher hazard ratio of viral rebound than those with no resistance or with low resistance but the results are not statistically significant. So this study presents some limitations due to, due to the unmeasured confounding and due to the fact that we still um, do not, we still did not collect any data about big tegravir in this study, but also some strengths due to the large sample, large sample size and the real life data. So to conclude, patients with GSS equal or more than two had a lower risk of viral rebound than those with a GSS below two, but not statistically significant in the overall population analysis. In general, after switching during virological suppression guided by genotype, all the INSTI regimens maintained high rate of virological success, even in heavily treatment experienced patients and even with low GSS and or pre-existing NRTI resistance. I would like to thank all of you for your attention and all the study group uh, that is here reported. Thank you.